Yesterday, though, we, we uh, asked Mick and Helen uh, to actually talk to um, a range of leaders from across the state. We, we said to them up front, we want your wisdom, but we don't want consensus. This is not about arguing over words, it's about it saying what, what actually it would make it work for you indep independently or collectively. And interesting, using that concept, we end up with a range of statements which we're about to hear uh, that were consistent. We, again, they weren't consensus, but they were very consistent. And we were really pleased that um, we had two very proud young Aboriginal Australians, West Australians, facilitate for us. Uh, they were Rhys Paddock, who works a lot in schools for us, uh, for children, young people, but also Krista Dunson from our office. I've asked them to present to you what Aboriginal leaders have said are really important issues that we all need to take uh, into consideration. You'll hear them today. Uh, we, we only happened yesterday, so less than 15 hours ago. Um, the information is still being distilled, but these are the key area, the things that we, we were keen to get their voice so you could hear it. We will put it into a document later on uh, and it will be sent um, to everyone who wishes to have a look at it. But hopefully it will help guide us in our thinking, a little bit like uh, Mick and Helen's presentation, guide us into how can we make this better. So can you please welcome both Reese and Krista. Um, big Kaya, Wanju, Morich Marmans, Morich Yorgas, that's hello, welcome, good men and good women. Um, so my name is Reese Paddock, um, that's Jones on my mother's side. Um, my, my mother's side, I acknowledge the people from my mother's side, uh, being a Baramaya Yamaji man from that side, and I acknowledge the people from my father's side as a, as a Wajala man from Belmont, which never sounds as cool. Uh, <laughs> I was, invited, I was invited by this mob here to, to come in and, and facilitate um, the, these sort of discussions um, along with Krista here yesterday. Um, so I'm really excited to um, explain to you all uh, what we came up with, but just thank you all for, for allowing me into, into this space and I'm happy to be on Noongar Country here, and that's me. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Krista Dunstan. Dunstan's my married name. I'm a McMeekin or a Moya. I'm a Noongar girl down from Esperance and now living up in the big smoke and working at, uh, at the Commission and we were, as Ray said, very privileged yesterday to facilitate an event with um, really inspirational, strong Aboriginal leaders who have a million ideas on what we could be doing better and how we go about it and um, we've done our best to distill that overnight um, so please bear with us because we're trying to be as true as we can to what we heard yesterday. Um, and I guess to kick things off, one of the key things that we heard was around leadership. And we heard that the time for other people speaking for us is over. We want to speak for ourselves. We want people to follow through on the implementation of the Uluru Statement. It's not enough to, to hear our voices, to collect it in a document and then say, oh, you didn't say what we thought you'd said actually, you would say actually, and um, now we're gonna go, <laughs> we're gonna go over here. So if you take our voices, you need to actually listen to them and do something with them. And um, the same goes for treaty discussions at a state and federal level. People really want to see the transfer of power and control and responsibility. Communities are willing to step up and take responsibility. It's just going to be transferred over to the community. Uh, we want to see Aboriginal leadership at the very top of government. We want our own Aboriginal commissioner. And we also want every state to appoint an Aboriginal children's commissioner to provide monitoring, oversight mechanisms and national and parliamentary reporting in what outcomes are actually being achieved for our children and young people. Aboriginal people also need to be represented in all departments because these departments are a big part of our community's lives and so we need to see Aboriginal people in them. And we want Aboriginal people to have a direct reporting line to DGs, senior Aboriginal people, so that their issues and solutions are actually being heard and are influencing the policy that's being delivered on the ground to give better outcomes. Aboriginal communities need representative groups working right across the state to be able to get information and identify issues and solutions at a local level. Policies and programs need to recognise in real terms the differences between the urban, regional and remote contexts and individual communities. And in addition to having access to decision makers and decision making power and influence, Aboriginal communities need information. Government has a lot of information and data around what's going on in a community, but not a lot of communities actually see that data. So when local communities are making decisions about what's going to happen in their community, what the key issues are and what the solutions are, communities want access to that data as well so they can make the right decisions. 
Okay, so under the theme of cultural context, um, which really embodies everybody, not just Aboriginal people, um, services and programs need to be premised on addressing children and young people in the context of their family, their community and their culture. Uh, the current approach, particularly in the child protection space, fails to include families in discussions and intervene, only, uh, and intervene early to support families and provide them with the skills and assistance that they need to provide uh, the best environments for the young people. Um, Aboriginal families are not seen as a resource to support their children and young people. We also heard that um, the people would like to see increased opportunities fostered for intergenerational uh, slash transgenerational communication so that the voices uh, and the experience of our elders and our young people are included and valued as a critical part of that process. Um, and also Aboriginal young people to have the access to culture as a resource. Uh, we want our young people to grow up strong in language, uh, in our song lines and in our dance and practicing our culture. Uh, connection to culture supports the strength and resilience of our young people, uh, young people who are our future. And on that point, um, I guess to summarize that, uh, the idea here being that it's, it's sort of the first step um, from, from my understanding that uh, people can sort of implement cultural things, uh, traditional Aboriginal cultural things into their organisations or into their schools. And you see it all the time and it's like, you've got something nice on for NADOC. And this is a really important, you know, great first step that we'd like to see. But now we, we sort of want our, well, not only our children to sort of lead these things, but also to provide the value so that non-Indigenous Australians can actually understand that value instead of it just being sort of a tick the box sort of approach. Um, so in terms of cultural context, that was sort of the key messages which came out of that. Around uh, funding and bipartisan support, um, it was acknowledged that what sh short term policy and funding cycles fail to do is recognise and address the magnitude of the trauma, which we've heard Helen speak about this morning, and the complexity of the issues, which we've also heard Mick talk about this morning, that social policy is actually trying to address. We're dealing with really complex situations, communities, individuals, families. So we need a long term commitment from both sides of government to ensure that we're all in it for the long haul and that. Uh, we wanted it noted that Aboriginal community members don't finish at 5pm. They're always a member of that community. They're always dealing with those issues. The Aboriginal people that are involved in delivering these services, it's their families that are affected. So we need to remember that and we need to support them and keep them strong as well. Funding should be proportionate to the need of children and young people and their families. Complex issues require resources and complex solutions. We need to focus on trauma-informed or trauma-competent practice and actual action. So just putting the words in there, trauma-informed, culturally safe, culturally aware, doesn't actually make it so. Sounds really nice, but we want to see the detail under that and we want to see the action that aligns with that. And funding should be reflective of the service user. So if you're talking about a high representation of Aboriginal children and young people in a particular issue, whether you're talking about justice, whether you're talking about health outcomes, whether you're talking about education, then you really need to put the funding and the resources behind Aboriginal organisations and programs and services so that we're actually delivering the right things to the right people and not just thinking we know, know what people need. And also early intervention and prevention is key. We talk about it a lot, but what we see money being thrown at is actually a crisis response and that gets us in this churn and we need to stop that. We need to actually stop and think about where we want to be in the future, where we want to be 10, 20, 30 years from now, and work backwards. What steps do we need to put in now to make sure that we get there? Crisis will always be there unless we start to think about that future planning. So I love this dot point as well because this was represented not only from you know, the, the community's point of view but also from the, uh, from the, the students' point of view as well which I think, you know, especially in this sort of forum, their voice is, you know, extremely powerful and we really need to listen um, to, to, those, to those children. And that's about using positive language, okay? And the idea here being that our children and young people need the resources and supports around them to see something positive in being Aboriginal because we keep sort of reinforcing these negative stereotypes and negative relationships and those are the uh, expectations of that what we set you know for our young people um, high incarceration poor education you know and it's again the idea to remember to celebrate our successes obviously you know working in this space there are a lot of obstacles there are a lot of um, uh, issues that we are you know trying to address and of course it's very easy to get I suppose um, 
too much focused on the negatives and just take a step back and really focus on the positives. Because as, as, the, as, as the children were saying, you know, when they were up here, they were like, you know, we want to we, we, we embrace our, our role models, um, you know, in a positive way. So it's about keeping that positive language um, and also everything that embodies, um, you know, being a, a positive, strong, you know, Aboriginal role models, non-Aboriginal role models and working together. Um, so our roles under another theme here is that, you know, we need to come together as, an Aboriginal uh, as Aboriginal community members with government and with the sector and collaborate on what is next. Aboriginal people need to be resourced to lead the design, the planning, the development, the funding, the implementation and the evaluation process uh, that create programs and service delivery in communities because it isn't enough to have policy makers decide the things for us because it just doesn't work. And again, um, very similar to what we've been saying all day. Uh, government and the sector need to be willing to unlearn the current ways of doing things and relearn better ways, you know, together with the community. We can't keep trying to adapt uh, broken systems. Aboriginal people need to determine these processes and these outcomes. Organisations providing services must be more reflective of the client base to achieve po positive outcomes. And if most of your clients are Aboriginal, then that needs to be reflected in the workforce. Uh, and this will create culturally secure and safe environments for both the staff and the clients. We want to see more Aboriginal community controlled organisations being resources, uh, resourced, supported uh, and funded uh, to capacity build and deliver services to the community and the families. Another one uh, we've got here is that we, what we most need from the government and the sector is to support and give the power and responsibility back to Aboriginal people to manage Aboriginal affairs and to demonstrate Aboriginal leadership in action. Uh, but, uh, but to also work in genuine partnerships. And I really want to sort of highlight this, this key word here being genuine. Again, you can, you can say things, you can do things, and it can be under the tick the box. But if it doesn't come from a genuine point of view, Aboriginal people for sure, they're going to know this, okay? Um, and just, just a small example of just a genuine approach is just something that I noticed yesterday um, with the commissioner here um, in terms of just a practical, something general that he did, which I, which I noticed. It was just at the end of the day and after our forum and after we were sort of going through everything, after everybody had left, you know, and we, we are here sort of packing up. And I noticed that, that this man here was actually packing up the chairs with us. You know, I was thinking, such a man in, in, in his position, um, you wouldn't really see that. But that just sort of gave me just an indication as to a genuine approach. So it's that sort of thing that Aboriginal people are asking for and wanting to see. Um, and I think that we are seeing this in this forum. Uh, and of course, and the final point here, being that more networking between NGOs, uh, government and Aboriginal community will help to support these steps. So that was um, a big authority there to get together with your government NGO and Aboriginal mates and have some conversations about this, I think. Um, whether that's on a Friday night or in a workplace context, you know, we all need to work together and have these conversations more. Um, and not only just have these conversations, but really gain some understanding so that we can deliver in action. Um, in terms of the design and focus of programs, Mick spoke a bit about this, um, I guess, in the Burke Principles, but programs and services working in Aboriginal community absolutely must be Aboriginal-led, and that's about self-determination. They must be rights-based, so thinking about the rights of the child and the rights of Indigenous peoples, because that, that's that extra layer that we have when we're dealing with Aboriginal community. They need to be client-centred, so we need young people right at the centre of the stuff that we're doing. Again, just like when we say we don't want things done to us as Aboriginal people, children and young people don't want things just done to them either. You need to actually have some conversations with them and understand what they want and what they need and what they think and what's going to work for them. And just like everyone, we're all different, so it's not going to be the same thing. And of course, place-based, so we spoke about things being lo not only local solutions, but local identification of the issues. So community will tell you what needs to be done in that community, what that community's priorities are. And when you build it from the ground up like that, you've got everyone on board automatically before you even actually start delivering. And of course, things need to be evaluated and appropriately resourced, and we've spoken about the importance of data already this morning. Um, We've really got to back things up. If we want to deliver outcomes, we really need to know what we're working towards and what that looks like. So we need to think about how we measure programs and legislation and ensure that they're actually meeting the intent of what we'd said in the first place. And a great example of that was the 1000 Project in Victoria, which reviewed the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle and how successful it actually is in achieving the intended outcome. 
So not just do we do the principle and tick the boxes and go through the steps all the time, but do we actually achieve what we're trying to achieve here? And the finding was pretty much, no, we don't. So we need to be really clear about why we do things and what we're trying to achieve and measure that and document it and step through and realise that if we're doing something wrong, that's okay. We need to acknowledge it and we need to move on and go in another direction. I find that often once we commit ourselves to things, it's a bit hard to back out. So we need to be always open and reassessing those things. Um, simplify the compliance process. Mick talked about having sort of the worst of tendering and grants. Um, the compliance process for Aboriginal organisations, Aboriginal services and programs is hectic. And um, we want to see them actually delivering services, not just filling out paperwork. So we need to think about transparency, about measurable outcomes and about why we do things. So we shouldn't just be reporting for the sake of reporting, it's got to mean something. And use the evidence already gathered from all of the reports and all the inquiries that we've already seen into Aboriginal issues and Aboriginal solutions and Aboriginal communities and actually develop and adopt our frameworks and Aboriginal terms of reference and Aboriginal systems. And when you do that, what you're going to get is transformational change because it's going to be with us, not about us. And uh, Aboriginal people and Aboriginal communities can actually become the champions of those changes because they've been involved from day one. So I think the consistent message from all of that and from across the room yesterday was that Aboriginal people want to lead. They want to manage and be responsible for Aboriginal affairs. And what's required from government and from the sector is to actually support that leadership, to resource that leadership, to be open to hearing those voices and really starting to create some action based on what you're hearing. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, what I can say about that is, while it might sound scary handing over power and no one really likes to do it, and um, the TV remote's a great example of that, you know, you've got it in your hand and someone else wants to change the channel and you're like, no, it's mine. I think Aboriginal Affairs is a little bit like that, you know, we've been doing it for a long time and we have control and giving up control is scary. But we're all in it, and it doesn't matter if you're in health, if you're in education, if you're in justice, you're in it to make things better. Like, we all genuinely really want to improve things for our children and young people. We want a brighter future than what we're seeing on the ground every day today. And so I think if we keep that in mind and we keep that perspective, then it's okay to share and it's okay to work together and it's okay not to be the one that came up with the brilliant idea, but to be the one that executes that great idea is just as valuable. So I just want to end by saying that it is so important to celebrate our successes as individuals, as Aboriginal community members, as leaders, celebrate the success that we're seeing on the ground because there is success on the ground. Things have changed and improved. It might be on a small scale, but it's there. And not only celebrate it, but showcase it. So our young people said they want to see it, they want to know where to look, they want to know what change is coming and they want to be able to make it even better. So showcase it and then build on it. And let's talk about success. Thank you. Thank you.